the New York City subway. To me, it's an unknown and quite overwhelming city. My brother is sitting beside me and my parents are in the two seats across from us, so we're facing each other. It's been a long day of walking around New York City on a hot summer day. I can feel the sweat dripping on my forehead and I try to ignore the fact that I can no longer tell where my feet are or if they're still there. I look around the train and notice how it's already getting late. I look out the window and start whining about how it's dark and scary outside. My brother turns to me and says, of course it's dark, we're underground. I look back at him and send him a death glare. This is when my mom, already annoyed, turns to us and starts yelling, stop fighting you two, I'm trying to figure out a way to get us back to the hotel. We were on the wrong subway line and we were going in almost the complete opposite way from where we were supposed to be going. This is a visual representation of what we were feeling moments before we started arguing. As you can see, I was already sunburned, tired, and hungry. Although you can tell that I was hungry from the picture, but I was hungry. And as the annoying teenager that I was, or am, I continued complaining about how if we had taken the right line in the first place, then we wouldn't be lost. Quite obvious, I know, but at this point, we were just pointing fingers at each other about whose fault it was. Summing out of our fight, we weren't the only ones on the train. There were about five other people or so scattered around, staring at us. A family arguing in a foreign language. So apart from being tired and desperate to find our way back, I was also dying of embarrassment. I was like, oh my god. A little ashamed of my family's behavior, although I was the one complaining the most. The worst part is that when my mom finally said, okay, I've got it. We need to get off at this station. We all focused really hard on the names of the stations that were passing by, making sure we wouldn't miss it. And every single time we spotted the name of the station and we were getting ready to get off the train, it just kept going. You know how a train follows a line but doesn't stop at every single station? Yeah, well, apparently we didn't know that. <laughs> Let me go back in time and try to put you a little bit more in context. It was the summer of 69. Just kidding. It was the summer of 2019. It just doesn't sound as cool, to be honest. Anyways, I was about to become a sophomore in high school and my family and I decided to travel to New York City for the very first time. As we all know, New York City is famous for, well, New York City is famous for a lot of things, but one of those things, it's a subway system. And as expert travelers that we are, we wanted to be part of the whole New York City experience and decided to explore the subway. In order to use any type of subway or train, you need to look at a map, right? And that's exactly what we did. But the map showing the different lines was a bit confusing confusing. We were on Times Square and I wanted to visit Columbia University, which is on the other side of Central Park. And I decided to follow my dad's directions of which line to take. I mean, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> uh, we took what we thought was the right line to get to the closest station to Columbia University. And after a good 30 minutes or so, we made it to Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn. The entire time we were on the wrong subway line. And this is the point where we were just all hysterically trying to figure out how to get back in the right direction. Long story short, I never made it to Columbia University. At the last station, since trains don't keep going on forever, we were forced to get off the train and finally asked someone to tell us how to get back to the place we were staying at. That night, well, that night I was just glad that we had returned safely, to be honest. But the next morning, I started thinking about how impressed I was by the subway system. I couldn't believe how someone can get that lost in such a well thought out system. I started to carefully look at the map and try to understand its complexity and how 
perfect it was. Even though at first sight it didn't look perfect at all as it caused my family and I to, uh, to argue and have a kind of scary experience, it looked perfect to me because I wanted to understand it. I clearly had no idea about how it worked and that lack of knowledge or understanding pushed me to want to learn about it. No one told me that I needed to understand the subway system. I just wanted to. As my sophomore year began, I had the opportunity to develop a personal project as part of my school's program. I immediately decided that I wanted to take that opportunity to finally understand the subway system. For this project, I also had to choose a specific subject. And as I started brainstorming different subjects that could be related to the subway system, I, th I started thinking how the subway lines just looked mathematical to me. But I was skeptical to choose about choosing math because I was uninterested and discouraged on the subject. At that time in my life, I thought of math as a boring process, which made no sense whatsoever. Still, in elementary school, I had enjoyed some areas of math and I didn't want to give up on it so easily. That, and I was extremely eager to finally figure out the subway system. And I knew that the lines had something to do with math. I didn't know what, but something. So math was the way to go. And as I started looking into what possible math topics or theories could be related to the subway system, I stumbled upon this theory that I had never heard anything about in my life. Not that I have lived such a long life, but you get what I mean. This is a relatively new theory that has almost nothing to do with the arithmetic mathematics that I was learning about at the time. And this was graph theory. This theory has also nothing to do with the bar graphs or line graphs that you're probably thinking about. No, no, no. Instead, they are... It's about lines and dots. Yeah. Lines and dots, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I studied more about these graphs and their connection with the subway system and found out how the subway system, any subway system, not just the New York City one, is made out of graphs. That alone just amazed me. The, the stations would represent what in graph theory mathematicians called vertices, which is a fancy way of saying dot, <laughs> while the lines the train follows are called edges. Now, that is a graph. Beautiful, right? I know. And with this information, I created a proposal, based on graph theory, of course, about how a subway system should look like in my city, a city that has grown rapidly over the past few years and that currently doesn't have a subway. As you can see, I created my own mathematical model from scratch using the basic concepts of graph theory. And we usually think that we can't be creative in math, right? And that we have to solve problems using formulas previously created by really smart people. Additionally, that mathematicians are the only ones who can create new mathematical models. Yeah, well, with this project, I proved how a 16-year-old high school student was able to create an authentic mathematical model of uh, what a subway system should look like in that specific city. And it all started when I was traveling for the summer, not thinking about school at all. And I developed an initial interest in the subway system which led me to an even larger interest, I dare to say a passion, on a mathem mathematical theory I would have never known existed if I hadn't gotten lost. And that's it right there. I figured out a way to contextualize a branch of mathematics in order for it to have meaning. Thinking back to when I used to find math boring, I understood the misconception a lot of us have about how math is all about solving these boring operations and memorizing formulas. And to be honest, that misconception is not our fault. 
think back to your math class and when your math textbooks ask you to calculate the number of watermelons you can buy with a hundred dollars how do i tell the textbook that i'm never going to be in that situation in which i need to calculate watermelons when i can easily spend that money in something more appealing yeah i know we've all read this problem before or similar ones in other words the application or real life problems presented to us are completely out of our context and that's why we find them boring i mean having to solve these math problems that have almost no connection to our surroundings or our personal journey just makes this learning process uninteresting and even fearful because we all know that math is one of those subjects a lot of people are most afraid of. This is when I ask you to think back to what I was saying moments ago. I was traveling for the summer and I developed an initial interest in the subway system which led me to an even larger interest in a mathematical theory I would have never known existed if I hadn't gotten lost. What I'm saying is, you can also learn to enjoy math, or, even, or maybe just find it less boring, when you actually know what you're doing and what you're doing it for. So, bringing back my story, at first, learning about the subway system had nothing to do with school. It was just a curiosity that sparked my interest in this specific math theory. I was the one to bring it into a school context. However, it was never about school. It was about understanding the versatility of mathematics, of giving math a second chance of wanting to feel comfortable with it instead of afraid of it, and of understanding how it can be engaging when I connect it to an actual problem in my real life. Although mine wasn't exactly a problem, it was one of those thoughts that you have on the back of your head that you try to ignore, but you know you're not gonna be satisfied until you find the solution or until you finally understand it, and you tell yourself like, eh, I don't really care about it. And in reality, you're dying inside. Yeah, that was me for a whole year. <laughs> and now that I'm a firm believer that math can be fascinating, what if I tell you that almost anything can be connected to math in a variety of ways? Yeah, several, more than one. So before I leave today, I wanna leave you with a few steps which might be helpful for you to spark your interest in math. And don't be scared about the numbers here, but number one, think about what you enjoy doing or a situation you've been in that sparks your curiosity. It can be any sport, activity, or even an experience like mine in New York City. Two, explore more about it. Just learn about your activity or experience. And three, the hardest step you might say, link it to math. Not, not necessarily the math that you learn about in school. It can be any type of math, just math in general. And you might say that I sound crazy for saying this because that's way too scary. But don't be afraid to dive into the mathematics related to your activity or chosen topic. Even if it has a fancy name, just explore more about it. What I'm saying is to start the other way around. Instead of finding an application for a specific math topic, Find what interests you or something that you want to understand and link it to any type of math. And if you feel overwhelmed or lost, just take a few steps back and try to understand the basic concepts you need before going back to the path towards your objective. And remember, sometimes getting lost is the best path to finding yourself. That's what happened to me. Thank you.